Hey folks, so today I thought we'd have a look at um, the three P's, so planning, prediction and protection, uh, looking at volcanoes, earthquakes and tropical storms. Now what you can see I've done is I've ranked them first, second and third in order of the most effective. And the first most effective measure for protecting lives from volcanic eruptions is prediction. Now prediction of volcanoes is actually really accurate and the reason for that is you can measure, uh, scientists measure the sulphur emissions that come out of volcanoes using equipment and that's a really good telltale sign to work out whether a volcano is about to erupt. The other thing that you can use is um, by actually managing and looking at how many sort of smaller earthquakes there are or mini quakes. Volcanoes tend to um, swarm uh, in terms of earthquakes before there's an eruption. So you might notice that there's actually, you know, maybe 100, 200, even upwards of 500 earthquakes, small ones around a volcano. And that helps people know what uh, is about to happen. Um, the other thing that you can do is look at satellite images. Now satellite images with pinpoint accuracy can detect changes in a volcano. So if there's a slight bulge in the side of the volcano, um, the satellite images will show that, and GPS data will show that, and that can be a really big indicator of uh, an, an eruption about to happen. Now all these things, um, all these predictions and things, really help people evacuate as um, you'll later realise that actually protecting yourself from a volcano is almost impossible. Um, so it's about getting early warning in and getting people out. The second most important thing is planning for one. So if and when a volcano does erupt, it's really important to have an evacuation plan. Now this evacuation plan would have been something that you would have discussed with your family um, the, something that would have been talked about and agreed. So in the case that you're at school or they're at school or at work, um, you all know where it is that you're probably going to head to that's safe. So you have an evacuation plan and a route to take to it. Uh, you might also, if you're an adult and you've got your own car, you might have an emergency kit that's in your car. Now this emergency kit would have things like um, perhaps a wind-up uh, radio or a torch um, with batteries, some food and water, things that you might need in the event of a volcanic eruption that would help keep you alive. And lastly, um, if you are living in an area that has um, lots of volcanoes, then perhaps even some of them have gone off previously, then there will be exclusion zones set up. So these zones are areas that um, basically the public are not allowed in. So that's helping people sort of plan for this and know which areas to keep out of. And then lastly, protection. Now, as I said before, there's not really anything um, much that you can do. If a volcano is going to go off, it's going to go off. And there's not a lot that can be done to save people's lives. Now, in the past, um, scientists have trialled expensive sort of heat resistant tiles um, and these tiles are used to direct lava flow away from people's homes um, but they're very expensive so they're not suitable for every every country not all countries can afford them also they weren't proved to be um, particularly useful either so they sort of worked a little bit but not very well so that's heat resistant tiles uh, to d actually direct lava flow away from uh, homes. Okay, Right, let's move on to earthquakes. So when we're looking at earthquakes, it's slightly different. For this one, the best method, the best P is planning. Um, it's not prediction, because as we know, earthquakes can happen out of the blue, and they give us very, very little warning. So the best one is to be to have planned for the event of an earthquake. And the best thing you can do for that is to first and foremost have taken part in some earthquake drills. Now just like we have um, fire drills in this country, countries like Japan and others that have earthquakes regularly, the children and adults will take part in earthquake drills where you drop cover, that's cover your head, 
um, and hold onto a table leg, often under a desk or a table, any bit of furniture you can get under. That protects you from a potentially falling ceiling. And just like with the volcanoes, having an emergency kit, a bag that sort of lives in your car or is easily accessible in your house, um, things like with food and water in it, that kind of thing, um, that's going to help you a lot because we know um, in the aftermath of serious earthquakes, those things are very limited. And then the other really important thing to get an organised and effective response are these new apps and warning systems. Now you don't have to have an app, even if you were just visiting Japan and uh, didn't have a Japanese phone, your phone would automatically be taken over by the government if, in the event of a tsunami or an earthquake and it would immediately come up with a warning uh, advising you of a potential earthquake or tsunami and you'd be able to get out of the way. Now the second most important thing after planning, still not prediction, that's, that comes last, the second most important one is actually being in a building that's earthquake proof. I always say they're not really completely earthquake proof, but um, earthquake resistant, really. Now, earthquake proof structures are so important because it's not earthquakes that kill people, it's buildings. So if you can be in a building with a counterweight that's um, weighted from the roof, that basically acts a bit like a pendulum and balances the building as it's trying to move, that can be really, really helpful. Also, you see I've drawn on here these cross structures. Um, these will often be made of things like reinforced steel. Um, they allow the building to twist. And that might seem strange to say that, but it's the buildings that don't twist, that are really, really rigid, that actually tend to break in the event of an earthquake. So actually allowing that sort of flexibility and allowing it to kind of move is, um, is what we're looking for. So we've got cross structures to allow some twisting. Okay. Um, also, you won't, it's not obvious, but shatterproof glass. Um, we don't want lots of glass falling onto people uh, below the building or even inside the building. Um, at the bottom, we've got shock absorbers. So this is a bit like um, this uh, suspension on your mountain bike. It just allows the building a little bit of flexibility as it's dealing with those seismic waves. And then we've got, often you'll see things like shutters. Now these shutters, some are automatic, some have to be done by hand. Again, it sort of stops the glass falling onto um, people below. And the actual building itself being made of reinforced steel. Now that's not appropriate in all countries, I know, but if we're thinking about places like um, San Francisco, for example, you'll find most of these features are in place. And then the third one for earthquakes is prediction. It's barely worth putting on here because it is so ineffective in saving lives because volcanoes are very difficult to predict. They give us very little warning so it's worth writing that down. Now, historical records sometimes can give us a clue. They can show us where they last happened and therefore where they might happen in the future. But the when they're going to happen is very hard to predict. If we're thinking about um, a conservative plate boundary, we can sometimes see where it happened last time and the time before that. And if, if they're moving in order, we can roughly work out and roughly sort of guess where the next one might be. Um, but that might be 100 years between. So historical records show where they may happen next. But it is, I mean, it's, it's, it's really nothing you could pinpoint. You certainly couldn't evacuate a city of 10 million people on the basis that we think it's going to happen. Um, one thing that's a bit of a giveaway is something called foreshocks. Now, foreshocks are the opposite of aftershocks. Foreshocks um, are mini quakes, very, very small earthquakes. 
that happen before the actual big earthquake. Uh, it doesn't always happen, but they can be a good good bit of prediction, but they may even happen seconds or minutes before the big one. So not really enough time to evacuate. Anyone that actually has any sort of scientific um, backing is actually animal behaviour. And my classes will know I've talked about this. Now, dogs particularly, but birds as well and, and, and other creatures, known to act strangely uh, just before an earthquake happens. Now, this is not reliable by any means, but scientists are working on this area of research and trying to discover if there's ways that we can make this more accurate. Um, but animal behaviour, dogs and birds, are known to act strangely just before an earthquake. Right, lastly, we're coming on to tropical storms. Okay, tropical storms, remember, these are um, the storms that happen uh, uh, just before a hurricane or typhoon, depends what you want to call it. Um, but the planning and the protection and the prediction go for hurricanes as well. So we're just thinking about all kind of extreme weather events, um, such as tropical storms. Now for them, uh, similar to earthquakes, the planning is really important because prediction is really difficult. Slightly easier than earthquakes, but still uh, quite low down. So when we're thinking about planning, you'll notice there's a bit of a theme here, uh, don't forget the emergency kit. And it's the same kind of thing, although for this one it might be, you might want to have some warm clothes in there, or you might to have, uh, want to have um, some water purification tablets but particularly food and water. You also want to have evacuation routes set up. Now these will be away from the sea. Um, they'll have been agreed with the family, so you will know roughly where you're heading. Um, and these will have been set so that people aren't all getting congested on the same road. So they will have been designed and shared um, to avoid congestion. So you'll know, you know, if you live in one area of town that you'll be taking a certain road out of town and that sort of spreads out the traffic. Um, and that also the city, I'm thinking of Tacloban, for example, in the Philippines during Typhoon Haiyan, um, they had stockpiles of... Um, emergency food and water. So this is like food that will last a long time, packaged food, um, and lots and lots of bottles of water. Now there are thankfully some things you can do um, to your area, to your home and things that will make it more likely to survive, um, say a category five hurricane. And the first thing you can do is have hurricane, hurricane storm shutters. Remember, it's the wind speed that often breaks the glass before the heavy rain or the waves or the storm surge. So getting those storm shutters shut, protecting the glass from smashing, potentially hurting people, um, is really important. Also, those strong winds up to 200 miles an hour, 225 miles an hour, um, can often move things like cars, boats, parts of your house. So tying down loose objects um, is going to really help hang on to your things really um, and then in your area because of that storm surge remember uh, you've got sort of a much higher sea level than usual it's almost like a mini tsunami so the sea is quite a lot higher due to the low pressure um, of the storm uh, rises up basically to fill that space um, you're going to want to put in place uh, for low-lying areas sea defences and there's a whole range low-lying areas uh, need protecting with sea defences so a lot of that can be put in place as protection in areas that um, are potentially at risk from tropical storms or hurricanes. And then finally we've got prediction. Now when you, if 
you live in an area that could have a tropical storm, what you'll notice, uh, like a weather forecast, they will predict using satellite images what's going to happen over three to five days. And they'll produce a little map that looks a little bit like this one. There'll be a map behind it and the storm getting bigger. Now this comes from um, a computer system. And one thing we know about tropical storms is they are really fickle. So they move and change direction on a sixpence. So they're really, really difficult to actually track. And what we have to do is just rely on that, um, those satellites and make sure that we're keeping a close eye on it. But de definitely don't expect any level of accuracy out of side of maybe one or two days. After that, because they become much sort of less accurate. And it all depends on the weather. And all this prediction comes from satellite data and computer models. Okay. So there you have it. Those are your three Ps. Planning, prediction and protection. And each one ranked um, for tropical storms and earthquakes and volcanoes.